All right, Philippians for Beginners. This is uh, lesson number six in this uh, series. The title of the lesson, The Mature Christian Seeks Righteousness by Faith. This is part one of this uh, section here. And we'll be covering Philippians chapter three, uh, beginning in verse one. So far in this uh, letter to the Philippian church, uh, Paul has pronounced a blessing on these people given them news regarding his personal status as he awaits trial in Rome, and of course his plans to revisit them when he is freed from prison, which he feels is uh, imminent. Uh, we've talked about that in previous lessons. In the meantime, he commends them for their faithfulness and their generosity, and he encourages them to pursue greater Christian maturity, and that's what uh, this section is going to be about. He then proceeds to describe five examples of the maturity that all Christians should seek after. First one, Christians should stand firm in the Lord and in the faith despite trials and attacks, temptation. Second thing he mentioned, imitate Christ. Christians imitate Christ and not those in the world. Thirdly, he says rejoice in trial. Christians are not defeated by trials. He tells them that Christians rejoice during trial knowing that the victory that awaits them and that the trials are simply a, a test of their faith. So in today's lesson we're going to examine the fourth example of Christian maturity that he gives, the fact that mature Christians seek righteousness by faith and not righteousness through a series of, of works. So begin chapter three, verse one with a warning actually. He says, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things again is no trouble to me and it is a safeguard for you. So he's got a warning here to impart, but he prefaces this with an exhortation to rejoice in the Lord, since this should be the standard, this should be the go-to position of the Christian no matter what the condition or situation he or she finds himself in. His warning will not be about something new. Uh, it'll address an ongoing concern in that church that he has probably warned them about in the past. Now he assures them that he is not troubled repeating this warning and is assured that in doing so he's guarding their souls from the error that is being taught or trying to be taught by false teachers that were creeping into the church in order to cause trouble. So the false teachers were referred to as Judaizers and they promoted the idea that you had to become a Jew and be circumcised first before you could become a Christian and thus be saved. So they were adding something to the gospel. So let's continue reading this section now that we understand where he's going. Verse two, he says, beware of the dogs. Beware of the evil workers. Beware of the false circumcision. So Paul, you know, he goes directly to the core of the matter. Now, to refer to someone as a dog was a serious insult, well, today and then as well, but especially in those days, because dogs in those days were not kept as pets. Uh, they wandered about aimlessly, usually in packs, and they acted mainly as scavengers. It was a term that the Jews used to denigrate Gentiles. So these Judaizers were workers, but their efforts and their activities were evil, he says, and had a destructive result. And the destructive result was the faithful Christians were falling away from Christ and the salvation that he had obtained for them, if they followed these guys. So the symbol of their teaching was circumcision, which they insisted was necessary for salvation. The thinking was this, I mean, it has some logic to it. The way they thought was, well, Christianity was part of Judaism. And if a Gentile wanted to become a Christian, he had to first submit to Jewish regulations, which included food laws and other requirements, but the main demand was circumcision. You know, their thinking was, well, wait a minute, Judaism came first and then Christianity. So it makes sense that if a, Jew, a Gentile wants to become a Christian, he should go through the process. He should become a Jew first and then he can be a Christian. 
Now we know the circumcision was an ancient practice among the Jews, beginning with Abraham, and it signified that the individual was included in the covenant relationship between God and the Jewish people. That was its significance. All boys were circumcised eight days after their birth. Luke chapter two, verse 21. Um, circumcision, much like animal sacrifice, was the preview or the forerunner, if you wish, of things to come when Christ appeared. We often see the relationship between the sacrifices and Christ, don't always see the, you know, we don't always see the connection with circumcision. So the sacrifices of the temple previewed a time when Jesus, the Lamb of God, would sacrifice himself for the sins of all men, 1 John chapter 2, verse two. The physical circumcision performed on the body was a sign of one's willingness to obey God and be one of his chosen people. That's what its significance was. This, however, was a preview of a time when God's people would be regenerated by God's Holy Spirit from within. Okay? From within and be circumcised spiritually. And so physical circumcision would no longer be needed for religious purposes. Of course, it continues to this day for health purposes, but not for religious purposes. Even in the Old Testament, the prophets spoke of what God really wanted. What did God really want? What did He say in the Old Testament? He says, a circumcision of the heart. That's, that's not something that's written in the New Testament. That was in the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 10, verse 16 and 30, verse 6. Jeremiah chapter 4, verse 4. A circumcision of the heart, the prophets spoke of. So Paul told the Romans that you know, physical circumcision no longer had any spiritual benefits. Let's uh, skip over to Romans, take a look at that. He says, for indeed circumcision is of value if you practice the law, but if you are a transgressor of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. So if the uncircumcised man keeps the requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? And he who is physically uncircumcised, if he keeps the law, will he not judge you, who, uh, who though having the letter of the law and circumcision are a transgressor of the law? For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward uh, in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that which is of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter, and his praise is not from men, but from God. And so Paul spoke about this idea of circumcision in different epistles because different churches were having problems with this. In the book of Colossians, Paul explains the relationship between Christian baptism and Jewish circumcision. Very interesting relationship. Let's go over to Colossians chapter two, shall we? So there he writes the following, see to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. For in Him all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, and in Him you have been made complete, and He is the head over all rule and authority. And in him, here's the part now, and in him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands, in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from uh, the dead. And so the Colossians also were having problems with Judaizers teaching the necessity of circumcision for Gentile converts. Note that in verse 11 and 12, Paul explains the two features of Christian baptism and its relationship with circumcision. Number one, that through baptism, Christ himself performs a spiritual circumcision on the believer. And number two, what is removed in baptism is not only a small symbolic piece of flesh, as in physical circumcision, but he removes the entire body of sin. So our sins are all completely forgiven and replaced by the Holy Spirit, Acts 2.38. 
This is why physical circumcision is not required. It is inferior. It is only a preview. It doesn't serve to remove sin, never did. It doesn't regenerate the sinner. It, only, uh, it is only relevant now for health reasons, period. Now the New American Standard Bible refers to the attempt to force circumcision onto Gentile believers as a false circumcision. However, in the original Greek, Paul refers to it as the mutilation, which is a little closer to what it was. It was a mutilation of the flesh that had no, for, for Christians, that had absolutely no uh, value. So this letter, or rather this better, describes the unnecessary imposition of this practice on believing uh, Gentiles. Let's talk about the, uh, the true circumcision. So that's the false circumcision. The true circumcision, we go back to Philippians now, verse three, he says, for we are the true circumcision who worship in the spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. So Paul uses this verse to summarize and compare the Judaizers and what they're doing to himself and the Philippians and the status that they have in Christ. He lists these attributes of himself and the church that he planted in Philippi. He tells them, first of all, they are the true circumcision. There is a circumcision floating out there trying to be taught but it's a false circumcision. They're the true circumcision. He says, we are the substance, not the shadow or the preview. Physical circumcision was just the preview of what was to come. We are the fulfillment of what the physical circumcision of the Old Testament pointed to. From a religious and theological perspective, we are the legitimate children of God, not inferior to Jews or Jewish Christians which the Judaizers were suggesting with their requirement to be circumcised in order to become a Christian. They were trying to set up an, a caste system. You got the real good original Jew Christians and then you had these other latecomers you know, who had to be circumcised and baptized. You know. So they were the true circumcision, the fulfillment of what Old Testament circumcision pointed to. Secondly, he says, we worship the true God and we do so in the true way. Now a better rendition of worship in the spirit of God, again, the New American Standard translates this phrase, those worshiping God's spirit. The idea is that Christians are the ones worshiping the true God and doing so according to his spirit. In other words, according to the revelation given to man by the Holy Spirit, in God's word, that's in spirit and truth. And the defining feature of that worship that signals its authenticity and gives it power and glory is that it is done in the name of and for the praise of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, not Moses or the law or any other living thing. So people of all kinds worship various deities, in a multitude of ways and in a multitude of shrines and buildings and sacred locations throughout the world. He says this was true in the Old Testament as it was true in Paul's day, as it is true today. Don't we get pictures every year of the millions of people that go to Saudi Arabia and, you know, for those festivals and feasts? in Islam and they always have a kind of helicopter shot, you know, just millions of people everywhere. I always tell people, you know, if, if numbers decide who is right and what is true, then the communist Chinese, their philosophy is the right one because they outnumber everybody. So worship, no matter how elaborate or sincere, even if practiced by billions of people, if it doesn't glory Jesus Christ, it's not worship in spirit and truth that God seeks from those who worship Him. That may not be politically correct to say, but it's accurate according to the Bible. The third attribute that Paul 
and the Christians at Philippi share. They're truly saved by faith and not works of the law or the flesh. Paul here does not only refer to the initial gospel message that the lost sinner is initially saved through his faith in Christ as the divine Son of God and this faith expressed in repentance and baptism, his hearers are quite familiar with this, having all experienced this at their point of conversion. Paul's point here is how one remains saved between the initial conversion and the time of one's death. The Judaizers were not only promoting circumcision to those Gentiles who had not yet confessed Christ or been baptized, they were also insisting that Gentiles who were already Christians submit to circumcision in order to guarantee their salvation. Ah, that was the hook. Are you really saved? Really, are you sure of heaven? Have you been circumcised? Because you know, if you don't have, you know, let's, Let's be sure. This was the pitch. Paul claims that we are not only saved by faith when we first become Christians, but we preserve that salvation throughout our lives by continuing to believe and trust in Jesus to keep us saved and preserve our hope of eternal life. Why is that? Well, because between the time of baptism and the time you know, Jesus comes or you die and you know, go to heaven, between that Point and this point here, there's sometimes a lot of living that goes on. And there's a lot of mistakes that happen. There's a lot of sin that happens. There's a lot of failure that takes place. And so somebody comes along with a message. Look, you want to really be sure now. You know, lock this thing in. Well, a Christian who realizes he or she is not perfect might, might really want to hear that message. A guarantee, you say? Something physical? The idea of circumcision in the Old Testament was that when a Jewish man you know, bathed or whatever, he would always be aware of his relationship with God because it had been carved into his body. And that was a little bit the, 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 the appeal to these Gentile Christians or these Gentile believers perhaps. Every time you look at yourself in the mirror, you, you'll have a reminder of your salvation. It could be quite enticing, you know, if you were a little shaky in your faith, if you weren't sure, if you weren't very mature. Paul says, our confidence does not rest in what the flesh does, whether that be circumcision or other works of the law, fasting or, you know, our confidence rests with Christ and what He has done for us. He died to pay the moral debt to God for all of our sins, all of them. It's interesting in Acts 2.38 where Peter says, you know, repent every one of you and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. He doesn't say for the forgiveness of some of your sins or for the medium, small to medium sins, baptism is good, but the really big sins, well, there may be some more stuff you have to do. Mm. And yet many times, isn't that what we think? We, we gloriously come out of the water, wow, I'm going to heaven, this is terrific, blah, blah, blah. And then you know, four, five, 10, 12 years into your faith walk, you start thinking, was that enough? Did I do enough? That's, that's not Jesus talking to you. So this allusion here to confidence in the flesh that Paul mentions, literary, literary wise, is, is a thought bridge to the next section where Paul will use this former life or his own former life as a Jewish Pharisee as a supreme example of one who had great confidence in the flesh and then he compares this with the new life that he has as a Christian. So let's talk about or Paul will now talk about his transformation. He says, beginning in verse four, although I myself might have confidence, remember he says, have no confidence in the flesh. Now he says, although I myself might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more 
circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. Now since the objective of the Judaizers was to bring the Gentiles under the law, Paul uses himself as an example of one who was formerly under the law and was under the law to a degree that neither the false teachers or their followers could ever match. And he lists six areas where he excelled if you were to measure someone by the law. First, circumcision. Unlike some of the Judaizers or their followers who were circumcised as converts or as adults, which was the case for the, you know, the Gentile Christians who were being seduced by the false teachers, Paul says he was circumcised on the eighth day after his birth according to the law. He had done it exactly the way the law said, eight days after you're born, circumcision. He said, that's my circumcision. Second thing he mentions, the nation of Israel. He was a Jew. He wasn't a convert to Judaism. He was a Jew. Third thing he mentions, tribe of Benjamin. He traced his lineage to one of the two tribes that made up the southern kingdom of Judah. The 10 northern tribes, you know, which was the kingdom of Israel, they were destroyed, they were scattered, they were, they were done, 722 BC. However, the southern kingdom remained intact and even though it was attacked and exiled in Babylon in 589 BC, a remnant eventually returned to rebuild the city of Jerusalem and repopulate the land. Being from the southern kingdom was a mark of pride as a true Jew with an unbroken historical lineage. He wasn't just any Jew. His people came from the southern kingdom through which the Messiah arrived. He wasn't just any old Jew, he was from one of the two remnant tribes. He says he was a Hebrew of Hebrews. This refers to the fact that Paul was a pure-blooded Jew. There were no marriages with non-Jews on either side of his family, all the way back to his ancestor, uh, uh, Benjamin. He says he was a Pharisee. The, the word Pharisee means to separate, a separate one. There was a time where the Pharisees were actually the heroes. You know, we always see them as the bad guys when we read the New Testament, but during the Maccabean revolt and you know, the intertestamentary period, you know, between Malachi and, and Matthew, there's 400 years there of Jewish history. During that time, there were revolts and there were all wars and all kinds of things. And the Pharisees became the heroes of the people because they were so zealous for God's word, they protected the word from the influence of outsiders that came in, the Greek influence that, that, that spread throughout the land and threatened to pollute the word with its ideas, the Pharisees rose up and they were the protectors of the word. So they started out as the good guys, respected among the Jews. They go, they go bad, they go overboard. By the time we get to the New Testament, they've become way, you know, way overboard. But he says, he was a, a Pharisee. According to the law, it was the highest position in society. Except for priests, but priests were decided by family lineage. Pharisees were lawyers who taught and interpreted the law. They were the strictest and most conservative religious group within Judaism, not just any old Pharisee. I mean, you know, a Pharisee, not any old lawyer, not any old scribe but a Pharisee, persecutor of the church. If you were to measure zeal for the law, then the most enthusiastic and extreme of the already extreme Pharisee was Saul. Saul of Tarsus, who actually hunted down and imprisoned other Jews that he believed were violating the law by following Jesus Christ. Paul is comparing his credentials as one who was zealous for the law and its application to the Judaizers who are preaching circumcision. Uh, 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 and, and so Paul is comparing his credentials to their credentials. In other words, this, these are my credentials as far as being you know, zealous for the law. 
your teachers, these Judaizers, what are their credentials? The implication is that in such a comparison, he is by far more pure as a Jew and zealous for the law than they are or could ever be. Now this is an important point to establish before he speaks of his transformation as a Christian, which we will cover in our, in our next lesson. Don't have time to kind of tackle that section. So this, this, is the, this is the preview, this is the prelude to this section. Next section he's really going to you know, explain what happened to him to transform him from this zealous Pharisee into the, you know, the apostle that he is today. So let's just summarize a bit here. Paul warns the church to be careful not to succumb to those teachers who are trying to undermine their confidence in their salvation, received on the basis of faith, by promoting a salvation based on works of the law, the chief of which was circumcision. He also reminds them of circumcision's role, true role. It was a preview of things to come. And the fact that salvation is based on faith expressed in repentance and baptism. This is where the true circumcision takes place. The cutting away of the body of sin by Christ in the waters of baptism. He tells them this is, this is what you have to hang on to. This is the theology of, the, of salvation. And so in order to expose the false teaching and legitimacy of these Judaizer, Paul compares their credentials according to the law to his own and he will then demonstrate how in his life he discarded these so-called privileges given to him by the law for the superior gifts that he has received by faith in Jesus Christ. Basically it's, look guys, we've got something better. We have something better than what these people are offering you and he'll explain why in the next section. Always try to draw a lesson, uh, something practical you know, from, our, from our studies. So here's the one lesson, okay? Satan is always promoting a better way. <laughs> you ever notice that? I got a better way to make you happy. Eat this, drink that, smoke this, pop this pill, you know, whatever. Be involved in this sex act. I've just got a better way to make you happy. It's nothing new. It's as old as the Garden of Eden, Satan's better way. For Eve, what, 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 what was the better way? Well, she'd have a better life, she'd have knowledge, she'd have improved spiritual life if she ate the fruit. No need for obedience, I have a better way to do this. Jesus. What was the better way that Satan offered Jesus? Well, all the kingdoms are yours if you worship me. No need for the cross. I have a better way. And in Philippians, what was his better way? Well, we have a better plan. The law and circumcision. You'll have a physical reminder of your salvation. It's a much better way than simply, you know, depending you know, by faith. You can't see Jesus. You can't see the benefits. We'll give you something that you can see, that you can be sure of. No need to walk by faith. We'll give you something that enables you to walk by sight. Much better to walk by sight than by faith. So Satan will always be offering us a better, easier way, even to be saved. Philippians teaches us to know and understand and maintain our salvation by faith, even when Satan offers us a better way or an easier way to maintain our salvation. Okay, we're going to stop there. We're a little early, but I don't want to tackle the next section. I want to give it all the time it needs to develop the ideas. Thank you for your attention.